Good morning, class. It's um, Mr. Duffy again, obviously. We're going to be talking about the anatomy of a criminal case today. Uh, and we're going to take a case from the initial proceedings, from the commission of a crime, and the police investigation, all the way through uh, multiple appeals. We'll talk a little bit about the uh, um, incarceration prop, uh, process, some statistics of prison, etc. So, after crimes committed and the police investigation occurs, basically the police investigation is going to be uh, uh, going to use search warrants, which are um, a request to a judge uh, asking permission to search a place or a person. Uh, and the Fourth Amendment, what we're going to talk about in class next week, requires probable cause to search or arrest someone. Um, so probable cause, or PC, probable cause, uh, are facts that would lead a reasonable person to believe that a search is justified. Okay, That's a really important definition. You should write it down. You should know it uh, for class, uh, whether you're taking notes or whether you're uh, doing filling out the Google Doc. Uh, now, under federal, under federal law, all felonies require an indictment from a grand jury to make the arrest. Okay, uh, Now, a grand jury is... A special thing. It, uh, there's 23 citizens on a grand jury. Um, it, it's not a it's not a two-sided affair. Only the prosecution, meaning only the state, presents evidence at a grand jury, and and probable cause is based on the evidence. Um, if it's established and the grand jury believes that it is, they issue an indictment to arrest that person, which is again help you know is authorizing the police to do something now a majority vote will indict someone and there's an expression in law um, that a good prosecutor can indict a ham sandwich okay that's how easy it is to get an indictment if you're good if you're a good prosecutor you can make anybody look like they're guilty okay sufficiently to establish probable cause now indictments are not indictments are one means by which you can get a uh, a person arrested. I mean, there's there's also, of course, police can arrest somebody if they personally observe a crime. Um, if the police officer has probable cause for the arrest, or if there's an arrest warrant executed for the arrest. And of course, if there's an indictment issued, they can arrest somebody. Now, as this image shows, uh, my guess, and I, and I think you'd agree, is that um, this is probable cause for an arrest. Now, um, once somebody's picked up by the police, there's an arraignment, okay? And now this is the first courtroom appearance of the defendant. And we call them a defendant because they're defending themselves against the charges brought against them. And, and, and so they're the person that's been accused of committing a crime. And the defendant's rights are explained to them. And they're the same rights that you're familiar with as uh, the Miranda rights, okay? Uh, they're told of the criminal charges, so that satisfies habeas corpus, by the way, that they're, if they're being held, they can't be held for, for very long until they're presented before a magistrate or before a judge and told of the crimes that they're being held for, what they're charged with. They'll be asked if they need an attorney. They'll be uh, instructed about their rights. Okay, if they, if they can't afford one, they'll be told that they can, you know, that a public defender will represent them, especially if they're facing jail time. Okay, if their liberty is going to be taken away from them, you know, they'll, they'll be told you need to get a lawyer. And then they're asked to enter a plea, a guilty plea uh, or a not guilty plea. Now, if, they're, if they've got a, a plea agreement, if, if they work out a deal with the prosecutor, maybe they want to plead guilty because they're going to plead guilty to lesser charges. So rather than facing a, a murder one charge, you know, murder in the first degree, maybe they'll maybe they'd face second degree murder or negligent homicide or something like that, which has lesser punishment. Okay. Uh, now, if they if they enter a not guilty plea, you're going to have a trial. And if the judge determines, and if the judge is allowed, they'll set bail. Bail is simply a monetary sum that if the person puts up and says, look, 
I promise to come back for my trial. Okay, and if I don't come back, you can take you can have this money from me. And they post you know 10% of it. If you guys have ever watched Dog the Bounty Hunter, those guys are bail bondsmen. They post bonds on behalf of people, and then if they don't if the person skips town or they don't show up for their trial, dog goes and gets them. Okay, so that's that's kind of the premise of the show. Uh, now, in trial, at trial, there's two types of trials. We talked about this in class, but there's two types of trial. Uh, jury trial, where the judge decides issues of law, ruling on objections, making sure that each side is being fair in how they're presenting their, presenting their case. And then the jury decides issues of fact. Who did what? Uh, whether somebody's guilty or innocent, that kind of thing. Now, in a bench trial, the judge decides everything, okay? Uh, bench trials go a lot faster. Uh, jury trials, while slower, um, you know, there can be an advantage to having a jury trial if you're a criminal defendant, okay? And it's the defendant who chooses what kind of trial to have, okay? Um, and, and, of course, and, of course, the reason they get to choose is because it's their right. I mean, it's, it's assured under the Constitution and, and the the uh, Bill of Rights. Now, as the as the district court trial goes on, basically evidence will be presented. The prosecution starts their case. They present um, witnesses who testify as to what they saw and what they heard and uh, that kind of thing. And then they might have expert witnesses. Let's say the case involves a, uh, a car striking another. Uh, during a high-speed chase, well, they might call a uh, the prosecution might call a um, car expert or a or a roads expert to testify as that there were no brake marks or skid marks of this length suggest that the car was traveling that fast, and they're an expert based on their education, based on their knowledge. Okay, and of course, there's written evidence, uh, paperwork. Um, there might be video uh, clips from surveillance videos that show something happening. Uh, all of this is lumped in as evidence being presented at the case. Okay, And the prosecution presents their case first. Uh, the prosecution bears the burden to prove somebody guilty. And it's a very high standard. It's uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. And think about that statement for a second. And you're going to need to write that down in the Google Doc if you do the Google Doc. What to you does beyond a reasonable doubt mean? Okay. Think about that for a second. Come back, pause the video, and come back. Now, I'm assuming you've paused the video. I'm going to keep going. Okay. And don't just write down 99% sure. That's not what I'm looking for. In your own words. U.S. District Court trial, um, from the defendant's perspective, um, is a little different. The prosecution bears the burden of proving that the person's uh, guilty. The defendant doesn't have to prove anything. They don't even have to testify. They don't have to speak at their own trial. Um, generally, a defendant's strategy is to poke holes in the prosecution's case. Uh, Remember, because the prosecutor has the burden, if the defendant can create reasonable doubt in the minds of the jury, the defendant walks. Okay, And, and consider what's at stake in a criminal case. It's the liberty of the defendant. One of the, one of the key concepts of the American governmental system, the American political system, is your freedom, your liberty. Okay, the, the, the burden of proof is so high because your liberty is at stake and it's considered so important to us as a uh, system of government, government that you, you require the state to prove it, to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. So what happens after the trial is over? Well, the jury deliberates. They go into a room and they talk over the case. Uh, it has to be unanimous. 12-0 decision. 12-0. Guilty. 12-0 innocent okay uh, if you have one person that disagrees it's called a hung jury okay and then you might have a retrial okay and retry the case before a new jury um, 
standard of proof in a criminal case is beyond a reasonable doubt. In a civil case, it's a lower standard. It's preponderance of the evidence. Okay, and preponderance of the evidence is generally expressed as more likely than not. Okay, more likely than not, this happened as opposed to that. And it's a much lower burden or standard of proof because what's at stake in a civil case? Money. It's a lower standard. It's not somebody's liberty, it's somebody's money. Okay, now if a person is found guilty, then he or she has a right to an appeal. Okay, they have an absolute right to an appeal to a U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. Okay, now there's no trial on an appeal. There's no trial. The facts have been set by the jury, or if it's a bench trial, by the judge. You're not arguing about facts. You can only hear legal issues. Okay, you can only dispute legal issues. Your appeal basically is, hey, you, appellate court, this trial wasn't fair because X, because the judge made an incorrect ruling on this matter, which hurt my client's ability to um, have a fair trial. Okay, prejudiced the jury against my guy. Okay, they're done, argued before three justice panels. Again, each, and we've talked about this, each side writes legal briefs explaining what the legal mistakes were made or not made at trial. Each side makes oral arguments before the three justices. And um, the U.S. Circuit Court uh, that they're arguing before will issue a decision, three-judge panel, majority opinion, concurring opinion, dissenting opinions, just like we talked about in class earlier this week. Okay. Now, what are the possible outcomes on an appeal? Well, they could uphold the conviction, which means the person stays in prison. Then you know, the, the appellate court wasn't convinced that they should release them. Uh, they could overturn the conviction. The person set free. Okay. Or a new trial could be ordered. The person stays in prison, continues serving their time. But that new trial takes place, new jury, new everything, because some legal mistake was made at the original trial which the U.S. Circuit Court says, yeah, well, you know, maybe the mistake was big enough requiring a retrial, okay? Now, let's say the person fails in their um, U.S. Circuit Court appeal. Now, they can appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, okay? Now, they'll write, they'll write a, uh, either a writ of certiari or they'll just make a straight-up appeal. Remember, we talked about this uh, when we talked about the U.S. Supreme Court. They're very rare, but sometimes the U.S. Supreme Court will take a case to resolve some issue. And, and again, there's no trial, there's no evidence or anything like that. The facts are set. The nine justices who hear cases from October to June, they hear two cases per day, three days per week, two weeks each month. Yes, I know, it's a grueling schedule. Um, then the rest of the time they spend researching, writing decisions, thinking, giving speeches, that kind of stuff. Okay, uh, now some, some statistics on uh, the, the um, justice system. Okay, as of December 31st, 2012, there are about 1.5 million prisoners being held in federal or state prisons across the country. Okay, 1.46 million of them were males and 108,000 were females. Draw from that what you will, those statistics, what you will. Um, now, more interesting, uh, per 100,000 U.S. residents, okay, so so as proportional to the, to the population, to their share in the population, per 100,000 U.S. residents, there were 4,777 black male inmates, 1,760 Hispanic male inmates, and 727 white male inmates. Now, proportionally speaking, within the population, the you know there are not more African Americans in our population or Hispanics in our population, and it's this kind of st statistic that drives the conversation. Boy, do we um, prosecute and convict and jail African Americans or Hispanics, minorities, at a much higher rate than whites? And is there is that an issue in our population. We'll probably end up talking about that in class. Have a wonderful rest of the day.